Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to Judges 9, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may, might more properly understand what he is presenting before us and so that we can, as we continue to study, be able to explain the symbols that are being seen in this portion of scripture. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to join again together, to open your word, to study, and to draw closer to you. Direct us now. May your spirit attend us. May your angels be with us as we accept your promise that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. We invite you to direct our study, to show us that which we need to understand for this time in Earth's history. Help us now, guide us in all things so that we may walk closer in the path that you would set before us. For this we thank you and for this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Where we left off yesterday was in the last five verses of Judges 9. Now, in this section, we were addressing that a certain woman cast a piece or a wedge of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. Now, because this woman was at the top of a tower and Abimelech was at the bottom of the tower, Abimelech had to have been not paying very close attention to anything else going on for this millstone to be dropped from a height and to be dropped upon his head. Yet when this happened, he called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said unto him, draw thy sword and slay me, that men may not say, say not of me, a woman slew him. Now, why is this important in this story? That the armor bearer provides the coup de grace, the final blow, to end Abimelech's life. I'm, I'm not sure why, I mean, you have some significance in mind. Well, I'm, I'm looking at this situation because the symbol of a certain woman, mm -hmm. to me, we're looking at a message and very likely it is a message that has been presented by Mrs. White. Mm -hmm. This message has been like that of a millstone, as in something that would separate the grain from the chaff. Because if you've got a millstone, you must also have a miller. If you, if you have a miller, you have one that has the experience, a message of experience that does 
create this final separation. Well, you do have William Miller. I mean, right. Miller's rules. Um, now, yeah, so when you put the grain in there, the, the chaff is already separated. So, um, so you're grinding grain. Um, it's just going to grind it. It's not going to separate anything. It's just going to grind. As, as you grind the grain, I mean, right now, I mean, as, as we have been seeing in this world, not everything right is, is correctly given. We don't always have whole grain. Yeah. No, I know because they the after the grain is after you have brown uh, flour. I mean, you can separate out the. My mom said they used to to when you would bring your grain into to mill, they would uh, give you your, your white flour and they would give you I can't remember the the word she used for it, but you'd get a bag of the bran and the wheat germ. Right. Right. That that would be. Um, separated out but but this is like Miller's rules I mean this is a millstone and it's the upper millstone according to the word there but it's a piece of it so it's a very particular piece there's some piece or some some part of the message that comes from using Miller's rules and the spirit of prophecy that's going to cause the death of Abimelech. So the, so yeah. the, point, the, the point that we're trying to get at right now is if this is Miller's rules combined with the spirit of prophecy, mm -hmm. how many times have we found within segments that are related with either the church or the movement that not all of the spirit of prophecy is being accepted or that any of Miller's rules are being correctly applied. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, people pick and choose. Right. Um, I mean, the best example of that was Parminder, especially with his parable teaching. Okay. Um, one is he was completely rejecting the spirit of prophecy through dispensationalism. And, and his whole parable teaching had nothing to do with Miller's rules whatsoever. Um, it was something that he could just bend... Um, not even just the Bible, but he could just bend whatever message he wanted to have. He could just bend anything into whatever he wanted it to be. Because to him, it was the narrative that you created. You know, if you create a parable, no matter how clear that parable is, it doesn't mean it's true. It's actually called a logical fallacy. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but people will sometimes create a parable as an argument and think because they've created a parable that they've somehow made a point. And that's kind of what Parminder was doing. So, um, but here we have, all we have is a piece of this upper millstone, but it's a certain woman that casts it, which would be the spirit of prophecy. Okay. What's an armor bearer? Always the one who carries the armor. He's sort of like a caddy in golf. Um, so, I mean, he's partly a, a, a bodyguard as well. Of, you know, because usually not everybody has an armor bearer. So is an armor bearer a trusted associate? Well, yeah. So 
so here is a Bimelex armor rare. A certain woman has cast a portion of a millstone from the top of a tower, seeking to break a Bimelex head. Now, the skull is not one of the easiest bones to break, but I would have to assume that something of even a particular weight could be dropped from a higher elevation mm -hmm. and would then cause a cranial fracture. So Abimelech's head is now broken. He knows his end is near. I mean, he might have been wrong about that. He might have survived, but okay. the wow. fact that he can actually talk and tell somebody to, to kill him, uh, he might have been... Um, you know, being a bit dramatic, maybe, but he didn't want to die by the hands of a woman. Right. So he says to the armor bearer, draw thy sword and slay me. Now, what's the symbol of the sword? Well, usually the sword is the word of God. <clears throat> so, the symbol of the certain woman applied as the spirit of prophecy mm -hmm. drops a part of the upper millstone from a tower to crush Abimelech's head. Mm -hmm. And Abimelech says to his trusted armor bearer, take your sword, take your interpretation of the word of God mm -hmm. and slay me. So that men will not say of me the the spirit of prophecy has had influence and has slain me. Right. So they're not going to want to have anything to do with the spirit of prophecy. Right. And his young men thrust him through and he died. Now, symbolically, when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. The cause is lost. Why are we fighting? But we don't have any other information about this tower, about the woman, or about the millstone. Well, we do know that the tower was in Tebes. Right. Right. So <clears throat> whiteness as something that's um, been bleached, like cloth that's been bleached. So we did tie that to the message of the Laodiceans. So we're tying it to the message to the seventh church. As we look at this and we tie it to the message of the seventh church of Revelation, we know that we are to buy from them gold tried in fire, white raiment, and the eye salve. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that we're seeing in this portion right now as a symbol is the whiteness. Mm -hmm. Which is the second. Right. So 
So I think that the point can be made that in this, the spirit of prophecy is a, a good portion of what symbolically brings about the end of this pretender, of this false narrative. Mm -hmm. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brethren. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their head, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubal. This use of the upper millstone becomes a point to help to unify this portion of the people. But does it truly begin to unify the movement? Well, it doesn't really say that here so much. Okay, then what does it say? Well, because this is talking here about basically the different, this is the dissolution of Abimelech's uh, kingdom or his message, right? So it's showing the different direction in which it goes. I mean, you have Gaal and you have um, uh, the other guy, Zebel, and and then you have um, this battle here at the end in which it's all lost. But this is all a message that is a rejection of July 18. Right? So it's, it's, it's what's left, in a sense, of the movement that has rejected basically the methodology that led to July 18th, that is the study using Miller's rules, using line upon line, and that that's being rejected. And the thing that I find very particular when it comes to um, looking at what's being presented. So I remember back when uh, I first had come up with the July 18 prediction back in, well, a few months after, so be in February of 2019. And Tabo started writing me some emails telling me that what I was teaching was error. And um, I ended up going to um, study at Collins, and Tabo was there. And he was trying to point out how I was not following line upon line, which of course I was. That was the thing that was so peculiar about it because I was putting it all on a line, showing the structure, you know, the time of the end, uh, the increase of knowledge, midnight, the midnight cry, the Sunday law, the close of probation, all those things were in my lines. And he was trying to argue I wasn't using line upon line. And then, you know, I pointed out that um, Tess's November 9th prediction wasn't using line upon line. She was using a different way of arriving at a date that we had never really used. There wasn't anything line upon line about it from my perspective. But, I mean, I'm sort of digressing a little bit here, but um, when it comes to what's happening in the movement presently, Nobody's really trying to sort out the lines. Like we're having a study here on understanding the lines, 
Right. But since July 18th, I haven't seen anyone trying to sort out the lines. And, and maybe the closest to it would be Odilio. You know, in his study of trying to understand the lines dealing with Nero. And, and to some degree, I mean, we might say some things to do with the pandemic. But pretty much in this movement, the understanding of line upon line has pretty much been abandoned. And while there's some lip, lip service to Miller's rules, you know, Colin tried to say that, you know, we use, need to use Miller's rules, he proceeded not to use them in his study. So he gave a study where we need to use Miller's rules and then transgress those rules. And when I tried to point this out, um, people got upset with me. So, you know, in this scenario here, um, what we're seeing is that this is really a path that doesn't end well. I would have to agree. Yeah. And, and what we're seeing is we're seeing the basic fates of those who continue down this course. The loathing, the infighting, um, basically the destruction of a message. Um, the other thing I, you know, I would say, when it, when it came to what happened with this movement in 2019, so when Par Parminder took the vast majority of the movement and put it under his control, I mean, we had what Jeff would call the 300. You know, the movement had been whittled down. And we now had Gideon's message, the message of July 18th. And... Um, so we saw what happened. I mean, we didn't recognize that, that that message, I mean, many people in the movement in FFA, when the message supposedly failed, the whole thing that we were to see is that we, it was actually a confirmation that we were repeating Millerite history. That is, we experienced the disappointment of the Millerites. And that shouldn't have been, uh, a reason then to abandon July 18. Because even Jeff alluded to that prior to July 18th. I mean, he studied, he showed how this uh, paralleled the story of Jonah, for one. So, and, and the other one was Abraham offering up Isaac. So, uh, to me, when July 18th failed, there shouldn't have been uh, a cause to say, well, we made a mistake and we should abandon it. What we needed to do was to study it. And to me, the answer was already right there. Um, and Daniel Fontenot understood it at that time and recognized that we had repeated Millerite history. Now, the, prob the only problem I saw with what people were understanding we understood it was October 22nd 1844 but only in a symbol in the sense that it was July 18th 1844 Samuel Snow's letters which prefigures October 22nd 1844 and so you know I tried to point this out in the lines um, in the paper that I wrote dealing with the first and second angels messages that those are what are repeated to the very letter Ellen White doesn't say the first, second, and third angel's messages are repeated to the very letter. She says the parable of the ten virgins is repeated to the very letter. That is, it has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter. And she outlines what that is. It's the first and second angel's messages. So in our history here, we are fulfilling what we, the repeat of history. And that repeat of history relates to the Sunday law. And what we, we don't fully understand yet 
is um, what 2030 means. But one thing we do know that what's being predicted here for 2022 is a rejection of July 18. Even if there is a profession that July 18 is important, even if we put up dates and numbers that are correct, but if we inter in interpret them incorrectly, then we are on a dangerous path. And that's the thing that concerns me is that, you know, there's a clear transgression of Miller's rules. There's a clear rejection of July 18th and all of the principles. Uh, there's a rejection of the line upon line. And if there is a mention of line upon line, it's often Parminder's errors of, of line upon line. So they'll talk about priestly Levites and Nethanim, but they don't have any structure for it and no explanation of our disappointment. So if we can't place November 9th and July 18th correctly and understand what they are, that they're not Raffi and Paneum on the line of the Levites, that we need to understand it's something internal. So this is the problem that, that, that I face is I don't know how the movement is going to be corrected unless it repents. But is it by repent? I mean, it's going to have to change course, turn 180, because it's going the wrong direction. Right. And, and yet, you know, we know that God's going to bring this movement about and the only thing that we can see is this slaying of this Abimelech's message by this woman with this millstone. Um, and that means it's also a fulfillment of the prophecy of Jotham. And the prophecy of Jotham is, in my understanding of it, the message of the 70th week, which is the message of the 2520 and its and. July 18th and its connection to 2030, to the first day of the first month in 2030, into which we're, we're brought. And this brings us back to the story of Ezra. And there's just so many different things that we have found that nobody's looking at. Even in, this, even in our studies here, we've looked at them and we need to come back to them again. Um, that's why I'm working on this paper to try to bring all of this information, the story of Ezra and how this fits. Um, cause there's just so many things that we've learned, but somehow this has to be brought to everyone in the movement. But since they've shut out any of the light that's coming from our morning studies, um, I don't know how we can, how we can help those who are searching for truth but are unaware of what's happening because some people are just unaware of it is it <clears throat> that they're unaware of it or is it that they have cursorily rejected it because it does not fit within their preconceived ideas Well, I mean, obviously there is a um, an attraction to the type of message that's being presented um, in the movement. Okay, because it appeals to human nature, and um, you know, obviously people hear stories, they talk. They have friends. There's just all of these types of things that that take away from the personal study. Obviously, if a person was studying um, and digging, they would figure these things out. But it is important to study together as well. But when I see the movement moving off in this 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 direction, that's highly speculative. It's highly emotional. 
that's very um, sensational, I guess, is maybe a better word. Instead of the solid study that is required that Ellen White calls us to do, um, I mean, we know that if you don't follow that counsel, you're going to go off the path. And, and we saw this in Millerite history, because the idea of the seventh month movement and the light of the midnight cry, um, to me, is very specific in the spirit of prophecy. Right. That we need to understand that light of the midnight cry if we're going to have light for our feet. And so in our movement, we have to understand the light that came in connection with July 18th, if we're going to stay on the course. But you can't force somebody to study something they don't want to study. The complaint is it's too difficult, it's too involved, it's too complicated. Um, and this sensational stuff is easier. I mean, they're not saying that, but it is. Because it, it, it doesn't have to all fit together. You can have, um, you know, believe a bunch of contradictory things when it comes to conspiracy theories. And I've had this happen before where somebody believes one argument and, and they've never seen that the next point that they bring up totally contradicts what they, they the reason they believe in something. Um, so these contradictions are never resolved. And, and this is what we see happening right now. It's just, in my mind, it's just very, it's what I would call confusing or confusion. They may say what we're studying is confusing, but it's not confusion. It's only confusion, confusing because you haven't taken the time to understand it. It is involved, but just because something's involved doesn't mean it's, it's confusion. The wheels within the wheels are are confusing but they're not confusion they have perfect order so what i see is that there is no perfect order there's all these contradictory things that nobody's willing to address but that's because they don't need to address them in in their in their sort of way of study because it's just what's the next sensational thing that you can bring up. So, you know, you see my problem. Right. I mean, I mean, it's all of our problem. But my problem personally is I don't know what to do. Other than we have to continue studying this. But when I look at this, it, it's not giving me a lot of hope here in Judges chapter 9 for those that follow the message of Abimelech. Well, okay. One of the things that, that I looked at when I was getting going this morning was I was looking at that at the uh, chart that Stephen had posted on WhatsApp, the one yeah. that you had up when we, were, when we were first addressing some things. Yeah, so these are the different periods of 30 years in the story of Joseph, the story of Jesus, the movement, and the Millerites. Okay, now I'm going to stop my share for a moment. If you wish to share that, then bring it up. Okay, so I'll have to do it this way. Just hang on a sec. Uh, I found this I found that chart to be real interesting. Okay. So there it is. Okay. So here we are. And Stephen has done a nice job placing the 12 years of Christ's life along with the 12 years here of the movement. Right, the to 9/11. Correct. And then we have 18 years from there until November 9th, 2019, right? Mm -hmm. So we have from 9-11 to 11-9. Yeah. All of these have that symbolism 
tied to it in that 30 year period. Now, we yeah, have 9 11, the Battle of Plattsburgh. Okay, agreed. Right. Yeah. Now, in looking at this and in considering this, we're also looking at the situation with this line of Joseph. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding from scripture is that Joseph was 17 when his brothers sold him in slavery. Mm -hmm. But if we are counting this, was he in his 17th year or was he in his 18th year? He was in his 18th year. So we have that he was in his 18th year when he was removed from his family. And now he has 12 years basically in Egypt before he becomes prime minister, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, well, they say 11 years, but uh, 17 and 11, which 17 times 11 is, um, uh, um, 187. Right. But, but 17 plus 11 only gives you eight. Yeah, I know. Well, 17 plus 11. Um, yeah, but that's because we have the, uh, how do we do that there? But there's 11 and then there's, uh, it's a bit more complicated than this. But because there's the 11 years, so these 17 years, and then he's 11 years to the dream of the butler and baker. And there's, uh, I can't remember how it goes now. I'd have to look up. Anyway, the, yeah, it's two, the 30 years is when he stands before Pharaoh. Yeah, two full years. Two full years, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, I was looking at some things because, Stephen, your charts always begin to make me think of different things. When we come back and we're comparing this with Joseph, along with everything else, including the Millerite time, William Miller was a deist who was challenged to either accept or reject the Bible. Now, we know that he served in a militia at the time of the War of 1812, correct? Yeah, now, I think so. Okay, he was, we know that he was living at the time when he is studying, he was living in Low Hampton, New York, right? Mm -hmm. But at that time, there was no national army. There I think it was was it not was it not Low Hampton, uh, New Hampshire? You could be correct. I I was always taking it as New York, and it could be New Hampshire. Yeah, you could be right. I'd have to look it up. But what militia did he serve in? Do we have any idea? I don't I'm know. Guessing. Was it Vermont? Yeah, he was he was serving in the Vermont militia. Okay. Now there's a huge difference up there, of course, with different militias. What is the state motto of the state of Vermont?
I have no idea. Freedom and unity. Mm. Now, we're in a situation right now where although we have freedom in that which we are choosing to study, we have no unity with some of our other brethren. Yeah, it's, it's Low Hampton, New York. Okay, was Low New York. Okay. Yeah. Now, in looking at this with, with William Miller, he is serving in the Vermont militia. He is serving during what is called the War of 1812. We have made note of everything dealing with the Battle of Plattsburgh and other battles that went on for this war. Now, I was intrigued as I'm looking these things up because William Miller was commissioned a lieutenant in the Vermont militia. And they were able to pinpoint the date that he was commissioned as such. He was commissioned a lieutenant in the Vermont militia on the 21st of July of 1810. Now, how this relates to some of the things in the Millerite history is he returned to Lowhampton, New York, out of the militia in 1815. Was he not granted his license to preach in 1833? Yep. Now, that's 18 years after he returns to Lowhampton. And in the time period after this, he begins to preach and give a message that brings people out of sleeping churches. Now here's Joseph. Joseph has been in Egypt, but he brings a message of a famine. In a similar way, wasn't William Miller giving a message about a famine? The people were not understanding the scriptures. Isn't that the same type of thing that Jesus tried to do with the Jews of his time, that you have this light, but you're not accepting the light. You have these warnings, but you're not listening to the warnings. Well, that'd be more John the Baptist, but. Well. Were the messages of Christ and John the Baptist that different? In some ways, yeah. I mean, they were they were still part of the the gospel, but his was a mess. I mean, Miller parallels John the Baptist. Okay. So if Miller is paralleling John the Baptist. Who does Joseph parallel? Well, Joseph parallels Christ. Okay. So, so there's something different here about Joseph and Jesus um, and, and Miller, right? Now, the movement, um, so, I mean, the 30 years here that, that Stephen puts, um, the Battle of Plattsburgh to 1844, I don't know if I would parallel these with the 30 years of the movement, that is, there's a difference here in this Millerite line than in the other ones. These are all dealing with the 2520. This one's dealing with July 18. I'm not saying there isn't a parallel, 
but it's not the same parallel that we see in the first three. Okay. Now, uh, just uh, just one other thing. I'm just going to share a, a different screen here. So this is the letter that Miller wrote on September 11th, 1814. 20 minutes past 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So what do we have there? What symbols? Well, you'd have a 220. Right, so you have 220, right? Right, he says, it's over, it's over. So what's that? A doubling. Or it's over, it's done, right? So it's, it's just two w different ways of saying the same thing. Right. So there's the doubling, right? Right. The British fleet has struck, has struck to the American flag. Great slaughter on both sides. They are in plain view where I am now writing. My God, the sight was majestic. It was noble. It was grand. This morning at 10 o'clock, the British opened a very heavy and destructive fire upon us, both by water and land. Their congreve rockets flew like hailstones about us and round shot and grape from every quarter. You have no idea of the battle. Our force was small, but how bravely they fought. Sir, Sir George Provost feels bad. His land force may expect to meet their fate if our militia do their duty. But in time of action, they were not to be seen. Action on water lasted only two hours and ten minutes. The firing from their batteries has just ceased. Ours is still continuing. The small arms now are just coming to action. I have no time to write anymore. You must conceive what we feel, for it, I cannot describe it. I am satisfied that I can fight. I know I am no coward. Therefore, call on Mr. Loomis and drink my health, and I will pay the shot. Three of my men are wounded by a shell with, which burst within two feet of me. Call on Mr. Loomis and drink my health, and I will pay the shot. Um, oh, I already read that. Uh, two feet of me. The boat from the fleet, which was just landed under our fort, says the British Commodore is killed. Out of 300 on board their ship, 25 remain alive. Some of our officers who have been on board say the blood is knee-deep. Their force we have taken consists of one ship, 36 guns, one brig of 18 guns, and two sloops. Huzza, huzza, which is a word we don't use anymore. 20 or 30 Brit British prisoners taken by our militia have just arrived in fort. I can write no more for the time grows dubious. Yours forever, William Miller. Um, so we have some symbols here. I mean, the 300, even though this is of the enemy, we see this symbol. Uh, 25, that's the number of days from midnight to the midnight cry. Um, we have 36, 6 times 6, and 18, which is 6 plus 6 plus 6. Um, so, I mean, Millerite history definitely parallels our history. And in understanding the lines, remember how we had um, addressed um, Miller's line, his personal line. So what had we done? What had we paralleled Miller's personal line with? Do you remember? I'm not recalling directly. Okay, here, well. I can bring it up. Um, so, just hang on a, a second.
Uh, it takes a second here. So <clears throat> so here we have uh, Miller's line. So we compare it to our line. Okay. And and this is part of this um, this understanding of how the lines work because Miller's line is a zoom into a waymark in Millerite history. So we have with him 1798 this increase of knowledge, his struggle. Uh, 9-11 in 1814, so the Battle of Plattsburgh on Lake, Lake Champlain, and then uh, the arrival of the second angel in September 11th, 1816. Its formalization in 1818 at the end of his two years of study, and then his first preaching of that message in 1831, and then um, the arrival of the third angel would mark be marked by when he receives his credentials. Now we had lined this up. We had a line, personal line of Noah. Um, we also had, uh, if I can find it here, I can't. Miller's line, Moses's line. So we looked at Miller and Moses, and we saw that they we didn't really complete this exactly with Moses's line. But we can see that there's still a parallel, that each of these reformers who come with the first angel's message also have a personal line. Um, Abraham has a personal line, uh, Moses, Miller, and um, we also, Jeff has a line too. I don't know if we have it drawn out, but... He has a personal line as well that's all connected to zooming into uh, the first angel's message. Okay. So when we go back to Stephen's uh, um, line there, um, one is I think there should be a lot more there. There's a lot more happening than what we... Um, I don't know if I would make the, the Millerite line line up this way, but, but you know, Stephen probably has some more reasons for why he's doing that. But, but you can see here, these all have the 2520. This one has July 18. So to me, this must be more some other way mark that's being illustrated that is parallel to this. But this this would be something in our movement too that uh, and oh, we can if you multiply this what's that yeah if you multiply the 18 by the seven you have a one through six yeah which um, yeah. is 25 20 gears yeah and you also do have july 18 at the end of the the one in the movement right so july 18 is connected with this one Right, and we do have July 18 in the story of Joseph with the 11 times 17. And, and, and we do have July 18 symbolized somewhat by the close of probation because that's going to be on the 10th day of, of the seventh month. And Samuel Snow's July 18th letter is... Uh, well, the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the year. So there is a connection there. But I think there's something more that can be done with the Miller, Millerite line and also how these are connected chronologically together. Because um, for the Millerite line, the main thing I see with uh, April 19th is that that connects to 2030. Uh, Right. So if you take in our movement, if you take if you take Millerite history and you want to connect it to our movement, I mean, we, we've done it a few different ways. But one way is to count 180, 186 years or 2300 months from April 19th, 
1844, and we arrive at April 5th, 2030, which is connected by all these symbols of July 18th to Collins' study and to our history. So I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying that it's incomplete, and it and it's not a direct like Joseph and Jesus are direct parallel. And we can also take Jesus and make a direct parallel to the movement. But this is not a direct parallel. It is a parallel. But it's it's not as direct as these other ones. I don't know. Does that make sense, Stephen? Well, I know there's the nuances within each line there that they don't. Mm. They aren't yeah. sort of like perfectly replicating, but I think there's enough there in the structures that uh, for me that kind of works just yeah. like it is. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm just saying that this Millerite line could be expanded differently. I mean, just on a simple level, and maybe maybe the simple level is good, but um, we are connected to Millerite history. That is, this history here of the movement is a continuation of this history of the Millerites. So I just think there can be more done in connecting these together. But but the idea is here. So so what, uh, Dwight, what you're doing is you're trying to look here at this 30 years and give a division of it? I'm just, I'm looking at it as a chiasm. And I'm, I'm just asking the question, is it possible that, that we have this same type of chiasm with Joseph and within the situation with William Miller? I mean, what we've got here is we have a timing of the Millerites themselves but Miller, as, as you were pointing out, is very much like John the Baptist giving a message of warning, but so did Joseph give a message of warning. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing that's interesting, I mean, we know that we connected this story of Joseph, um, particularly with the story of Jacob, the death of Jacob, when he blesses his 12 sons. Right. By these period of... Uh, uh, was it 1764 years going from 1731 BC to 34 AD and then the same uh, period of time going from 34 AD to 1798 so the 1764 years being 7 times 252 connected the story of Joseph to Millerite history exactly but Millerite history starts in 1798, not in 1814. Um, so there is another way in which to understand Millerite history, though, in its connection to the story of Joseph. And um, so there is something that we need to, to, that you know, I kind of see it, but I can't explain it yet, how we would look at the parallel of Joseph because see we look at Joseph lining up with Christ right and we can connect the story of Joseph to the story of Christ with this first 1764 years but that story of Joseph is connected with the story of Jacob and Joseph is the fourth angel's message right because you have Abraham Isaac and Jacob the three and then you have the three one combination with Joseph. So I think there's just something here about the Millerite history that we have to look into, that this idea is correct, but this is zooming into um, uh, this 30 years is for Miller particularly, not necessarily the Millerites. Okay. 
and and I probably would have put Jeff here and Miller here rather than the movement and the Millerites. But the movement is yet connected with all this. I know, but this is more, this is Jeff, right? Because I understand the movement's connected to it, but I'm just saying as a parallel, I would have put Jeff here because this is where Jeff, this is where Jeff ends July 18, 2020. And he begins 1989. And we often say this is the movement, but really this, this is really Jeff. He's connected to the movement, just as Jesus is connected to the disciples. And then here I would have put Miller. And then we would have Miller and Jeff lined up together. I don't know. That's maybe I'm being kind of picky about it. Well, in this, within the movement, as I've had conversations with others, there's been no disagreement that Joseph was a prophet, that John the Baptist was a prophet. We can go through many other situations as to the definition of a prophet. Mm -hmm. Now, I have been very direct with many brothers and sisters that I have seen Elder Jeff as also a prophet. Mm -hmm. Now, we have in this situation, in these lines, we are establishing that those that will be of the 144,000 will serve as, as did Christ, but in this manner, they're also going to be serving as prophets. These lines that we're looking at right now are giving us a pattern to come to an understanding of what these Joseph, Jesus, Miller, etc., have gone through to become not just justified, but also sanctified in giving a message. Okay. Now we know this is a wheel within a wheel. So when we deal with line upon line, we're not necessarily just looking at lines, we are looking at how they're connected with each other. Right. Right. So, I mean, we can just take, you know, every history and we can draw a line and we can say it's like the uh, medical book, you know, anatomy book, transparencies. We see detail as we lay each line upon each other. But we also know that each of these lines has a function just as a transparency book does. And each line addresses a period of darkness. And... Right. And then the increase of light that comes with that. But we also know that when we look at, so to think of the wheel of the within wheel idea, um, when we look at the story of Jesus, for instance, I mean, it's, it's, it has a time prophecy attached to it. And, you know, it appears to end in 34 AD, but we know, of course, there's still going to be 70 AD because the week of Christ in Daniel chapter 9 is attached to the destruction of Jerusalem. But we know from Christ's sermon in Matthew that the destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the end of the world. And we also know from Daniel's prophecies, the 2300 days, that the 70 weeks isn't the end of things. There's still 2300 years. And that 2,300 years is going to end in Millerite history. So Millerite history is a wheel 
or a line that exists within another line. In some ways, it's a repeat of history. I mean, the first sermon I ever preached on this message, after I had understood it, was um, in December of uh, uh, 2010. I preached a sermon at Warburg Church showing the parallel between the disappointment of Christ, Christ's disciples, and the disappointment of the Millerites. And Ellen White lays out all of these parallels between these two histories. So we know it's a repeat of history, but it's a repeat of history that's connected prophetically. It doesn't just pop out of nowhere. It's connected with the 2300 days, which is the, 20, the 70 weeks is a part of. And then when we deal with our history, we know that Ellen White, she has this line, the third angel arrives in 1844, October 22nd, and then it's going to be joined by this other angel at the Sunday Law. And all of the study that, that we've shown is to see that our history is a repeat of Millerite history, but it's a repeat of Millerite history in that um, the first and second angel's messages were rejected, and the third angel's message was rejected in 1888 and that our history is a zooming into that Sunday law. That third angel's message has to have a first and a second um, in order for it to be empowered at the Sunday law. And since right. they rejected, we have to repeat that history. But that, that is still something that's a wheel within a larger wheel. So when we look at each of these, these lines, we need to know what it is we're looking at because even if you put a 30-year line there um we need to know what that means and 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 i think that miller's 30 years here and jeff's 30 years these are something that um jeff definitely didn't understand where he was in miller didn't understand where he what he was doing and i would say that in some ways this history of jeff just like the history of the millerites is is something that's incomplete that is it's it's still to be completed in the future miller and jeff serve this role but it's not it's not the completion of the message October 22nd, 1844, doesn't bring about the second coming. July 18th, 2020, is again a prediction that's unfulfilled. But the fulfillment is going to be what they're typifying, is going to be the Sunday law, right? Because Jeff paralleled October 22nd, 1844 with the Sunday law. And we didn't do that specifically with July 18th, but the part of the line of July 18th is still connected with the Sunday law. It's just we're more more detail in that. But we know that the Sunday law is still future, but also midnight and the midnight cry are still future. But not in Jeff's line, because in Jeff's line, this is midnight. Right? And and we have July 18th as the midnight cry. Correct? Agreed. So, so I'm trying to understand the lines. But, I mean, that's what this study is about. And, and I don't think that this gives us a complete understanding of the lines, even though we can lay, lay this parallel down. I'm not, so the parallel is correct, but it's just it's where we're placing it. Yeah, I think uh, it is typical or movement mm -hmm. of what's going to be taking place. We know the midnight, the midnight cry by Marx, and then the Sunday law, mm -hmm. still future. Yeah, but I don't think I think when they occur, there's not going to be these going over this history drawn lines. It's just going to be a message come out of Babylon. You know, don't take the mark of the beast. We're not going to be and this here, look, this, we're repeating this history, this is happening. So I think God is showing us these things now. Mm -hmm. 
and then that has, that's basically that will be it. And then it's, it's just a matter of giving the three angels messages. I, so, I, don't, I don't really see us with a whiteboard going to the world or whatever. To, maybe the Levites, you could you could do some of this here, but a lot of people, it's um, it's just going to be like the living testimony. Yeah, well, but so so we know that the message to the Levites still has a midnight and a midnight cry coming. Right? Are you saying that we're not going to? Yes. Okay, so we are going to have that. Well, we understand. Well, we understand there's Rafi and Panayim. Right. So, so, so what I'm saying why is. Why we that, connect them to. Okay. So are we. So you would agree that we're more we're zoomed into something in our history, that as we pass through these through history, we're going to move into the bigger line. Does that make sense? That as we pass through, yes, history, but it's not going to be. Yes, but it's not going to be something we're going to be analyzing as much. Ah, it's just I, going to be a, a more. Living testimony message. Yeah, yeah. So the one, yeah, I would agree there. And and so the one thing I see is that with with Jeff's movement, because what we when we examine the foundation, one thing we saw is that Jeff originally was more on the big line, right? That is, he was looking for the Sunday law, and then he saw this repeat of history. The first and second angels' messages need to be repeated. He didn't see nine eleven; it hadn't happened yet. Um. And he was looking at things pretty much like any conservative Adventist would look at things, other than when he saw the fulfillment of, of Daniel 11, verse 40b, he marked it as the time of the end. So I knew about the fulfillment of that, but I wouldn't have marked it as the time of the end, because I would just think the time of the end, 1798. But once you see it, and you can't unsee it, you know that it is the time of the end and that we're repeating those first and second angels' messages, we're repeating Millerite history. But as, as the movement progressed, in a sense we moved further away from the big line and we kept zooming in. So it started with Jeff in 1989, but as we continued to move through these, this history, we kept bringing this Sunday law, this close of probation, further and further into this smaller and smaller category. But now, as we progress, we're going to begin to zoom, zoom out. That is, we're going to move back into the big line. You know, because once we get to the actual Sunday law, we're not, as, as Stephen is saying here, you know, we're not going to be analyzing all of this in this way. This is something given for us to understand. Now, there may be lots of things that we've learned that we're going to be sharing, but I think, you know, the idea of the living testimony, I think is is the main point when it comes to the message to the world. I mean, there might be the odd person uh, who's going to be looking into some of these things that we studied, but I don't think that these things are particularly what we're going to be presenting to the world. There'll be much broader things. Does that make sense, Stephen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dwight, you got. Okay. Some so the you know in in all of this as we're, as we're looking at these with these patterns. The symbols that we have come to accept and understand are being very clearly presented. That mm -hmm. there's a 30-year preparation time before Christ could serve, be anointed, and begin to minister. There was a 30-year preparation time for Joseph. Now, we're looking at this with the movement, that there's 30 years wherein the movement itself is to become prepared before they can begin to give a message. 
Now, we know that there was a disappointment with the disciples when Christ was crucified. We recognize that there has been a disappointment within the movement. We know that there were disappointments within this with the Millerites. We understand clearly that there were predictions that were made that went unfulfilled. Now, all of these lines in comparison are helping us to understand some of where we are currently. Mm -hmm. Now, can we place the situation with Abimelech on a similar line? Well, I, or is that going to confuse issues? Well, no, I, I think we can. Um, now, the situation of Abimelech, in a sense, is a repeat of history. Okay. So it, has, so it has to be a line. Right? Because if you have a repeat of history, it's, it's always going to be a line. All right. So, um, so yeah, we'd ha I'd have to think about it a bit in a bit more detail how these different, um, and and when we looked at the other enemies, like we had this line drawn out. So we're probably going to have to come back to that tomorrow um, to look at the different enemies that were left and how these judges re represent something in our history, right? But now you're going to have this story of Abimelech, which isn't an external enemy, but an internal enemy, and understand how that fits within that that history of the judges, the story of the judges, because we're saying the story of the judges is bringing us from 9/11 to the end of, well, at least 2023, at least in of Judges, what is Judges chapter two, I think. Um, now, as far as 30 years, um, you know, we could have other 30-year periods. I mean, we have the 30 years from the time of the end, but we can see that Miller's 30 years doesn't start at the time of the end. And so the 30 years doesn't have to begin at the time of the end. Correct? No disagreement. Now, now I find it interesting. If I go from 9-11-2001 and I count 30 prophetic years, it brings me to Passover in 2030, or 2031, pardon me. So it brings me to Passover in 2031. That's 10,800 days. So, so there is a, that would then be, you know, it goes past 2030, but it brings me to that Passover. It doesn't just bring me to some arbitrary date in 2031. So, you know, so there might be something in the sense of the 30 years there from 9-11 that we just don't see yet. There will be something that we need to uncover. Yeah. Now, there were some comments in the chat. So, one of the comments was applying John 660 with letter 41A of 1874. Why was this important? Put that in when you guys were saying that people aren't applying themselves to follow our, our, our morning meetings because they think it's confusing or hard. Right. Well, 
I have brain damage. I mean, pe people realize that I decided to apply myself because I knew that I, as I applied myself, the Lord was going to reward it and he was going to heal me. I'm in the process of healing. We're all in the process of healing, really, because we all right. have our mortal bodies. But uh, in the in 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 that letter 41a, uh, Ellen White says, "Life is full of duties that are not agreeable, but all these unpleasant duties, yeah, they might seem unpleasant to us, will be made agreeable by a cheerful performance of them because it is right." taking an interest in the duties which someone must do and striving to do them with the heart will make the most disagreeable duties pleasant. As I apply myself, I mean, I don't retain everything. I don't grasp everything right away, but I do determine to learn it. If I can't learn it here, I will learn it in eternity. That's what I vow. That's what I, I'm, I'm striving for, right? And I think that's, if this is God, this is God's wisdom, then wouldn't it be beneficial to us to apply ourselves to grasp as much as we can while we can? This is what I, I, I want to ask people, you know, I ask myself this. Yeah, it's tough. It's hard. It's a struggle. Well, life is a struggle. This is our learning ground. Let's make the best that we can. And as we put forth the effort, God will enhance it. God will enable us. It's that simple. There were several, several good points over this that we, we do need to apply. In, in many ways, a lot of us have not wanted to apply ourselves because if we apply ourselves, we might find more defects of character right and that's what we need to face and we need to get rid of them how can you strive to heal something if you're unwilling to face that you have it how right. can we enter heaven with a lazy slothful intellectually and spiritually indolent attitude read the spirit of prophecy how much does she disdain that and try to correct us from it i mean you dwight have presented so much on how we need to be purging ourselves from these flaws. We can't do it ourselves. If we're unwilling to do it, one thing I learned just the day I met Jeff and Kathy, 2018, I said, Lord, there's certain things in my life I'm not willing to give up. Please make me willing to be willing and accept your will above my own. We need to make that decision every day of our lives. Otherwise, we will be lost. We're either going forward or we're retrograde, retrograding. Agreed. Now, uh, just uh, one thing I wanted to add. So when somebody talks about something's too hard, and I've seen this in both in this movement when it comes to studying chronology, but also I've seen it with people who, um, and there can be all kinds of situations, people who are drug addicts, people who um, their marriages are breaking down and, you know, they're in this situation and they give this excuse, it's too hard. But the, the choice is, is harder. Like if you don't follow the solution, you're actually taking a harder road. Amen. Oh, and I was a drug addict and I've had broken marriages. So people, if you're going to use that as an excuse, it's not an excuse. Yeah. If people I say, can do it as they say, anybody can. Oh, it just depends on your will. Okay. Yeah. But in, in this, day by day, moment by moment. Yeah. In this situation, let us also recall the situation of Ellen Harmon. Mm -hmm. Now, we all have, to an extent, a type of brain damage. Because we are not as Adam and Eve were, especially Adam, coming directly from the hand of God. Ellen White, as a child, was struck by a stone. Right? So was uh, mm -hmm. And did mentally, was she able to retain much as a child? No. 
but yet as an adult relying day by day upon Christ look at the healing that came with her ministry and with all that she was able to do. Amen. Now, one of the other comments from the chat said that the last line of Miller's letter, there is 2030. Yes, his Haza Haza, 20 or 30 British prisoners taken by our militia. Yeah, so Haza Haza, hooray, hooray. Yeah. A doubling. And then 2030. Wow. I never noticed that till now. Yeah. And this is written on September 11th. 11, right. So. So there's, there's a lot that we have addressed within this letter of Miller within what we're looking at here and how all of this is going to interrelate. Much of these studies, examining the lines, require us to be able to apply what we're seeing in these different portions of judges to be able to place this upon a line. So this is going to be more of the work that we collaboratively are going to need to do. We cannot rely upon one or two people to point these things out. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to, as a group, be able to, in a spirit of unity, look at these items, place these items on a line, address the issues that we're seeing, and then be able to present them, whether or not others are wanting to accept what's being done. All of these things are interrelated with July 18th. All of these items are interrelated with numbers and chronology. All of these are not in any difference from the messages that were presented by Ezekiel, by Daniel, by William Miller. That's the way I'm looking at this. Okay. Um, just another point is it's interesting. After he signs his letter on September 11th, he says, give my compliments to all and send this to my wife. Okay. So what would the wife represent? Home, but also, I mean, woman as church. I mean, how would you apply that? Yeah, so this would be to, to the wife, to the bride. Right. Right. To us. Yeah. So this is a message that's, that's given to the end of time, to those at the end of time. Um, and the word compliments, well, this is an expression of civility, respect, or regard, as to send or make one's compliments to an absent friend. Right. Um, so maybe this is stretching it a bit, but if you use an expression of civility, wouldn't this be, in some ways, a symbol of uh, the the church and state? I don't know. Maybe that's stretching it. Compliments, <laughs> civility, civil and religious. So referring to the period of the Sunday law. Okay. I don't know, but uh, it could very well be. Okay. So now we're, we are at the end of our time for today's session. Mm -hmm. We've actually had some very good communication and conversation about many different points today. And for each of you, I thank you. Now, shall we close this meeting with prayer?
Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities that we've had to come together before you. As we proceed through this day, help us to consider these things that we are learning and these things that have been presented. Direct us now so that all that is done today may be according to your spirit and according to your character so that all may see you in our words and in that which we do. Bless us this day. We ask, direct us. May we be able to walk with our hand in yours. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.